which I'm stop switch can't stop switching all the day. Uh, so Harald Welte and Steve Markgraf are going to show you what or other awesome things you can do with GSM. Please have a great welcome. I'm uh, sort of waiting for my screen to show up there um, on the screen. I'm not sure if anyone can do something about that. Ah, thank you. OK, well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the welcome. Um, I'm Harald Welte. Over there is Steve Markgraf. We're going to talk about Osmocom BB, which is a project that's not even one year old, um, but has already managed to, uh, well, create uh, quite a lot of results. Um, it's about running your own GSM stack on a mobile telephone. <coughs> now, um, I'm going to go through a bit of a, I don't know, conceptual introduction. By the way, if you've been to this presentation or to my presentation about the same subject at DeepSec or a different event, um, it's not really going to be that different. So um, to introduce about GSM and 3G protocol security, um, there's some, some observations that I want to share. Uh, mostly that both the GSM and TCP IP protocol specs are as, as publicly available as uh, the other one. So there's no difference in availability of public information. And if you look at the internet protocol stack, and I mean, when I say internet protocol stack, I mean Ethernet, Wi-Fi, TCP IP, and so on, they receive a lot of scrutiny from the academic community, from the independent hacker community, from whoever. Everyone looks at those kind of protocol security issues for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years now at least. Um, GSM networks are as widely deployed as the internet. The, uh, if you look at the user base, number of subscribers, we're talking about billions of, of I think it's three billions is what the GSMA claims uh, these days. Um, but the GSM and 3G protocols don't receive that amount of scrutiny. They don't uh, get the amount of research, uh, despite the fact they're widely deployed networks, they are, the, the specifications are open. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. And um, that's uh, what I want to talk about for a minute or two. The GSM industry is extremely closed, and I frankly have to add it's closed-minded as well. Um, there are only very, very few closed-source protocol stack implementations that uh, exist. Um, four might be too low a number, but if it's four or six, it doesn't really make a big difference. My point is it's a small number. Um, the chipset manufacturers that produce uh, baseband chipsets that are used in mobile telephones uh, never release hardware documentation publicly. They even only release it in a very limited fashion to the actual cell phone manufacturers. Um, and it's, it's a very closed, um, closed club. If we look at the, the handset manufacturing side, the companies that manufacture these devices, um, we have, uh, well, First of all, before we get into device manufacturing, we have to look at the chipset manufacturing, the companies that produce the baseband chipsets that are in those uh, telephones. And there are only very few companies that build those uh, baseband chipsets today. It's once again, I would say, a number about six. Um, and uh, those companies, they, you know, they, they license an operating system kernel from somewhere else. They often license uh, or used to license a GSM protocol stack from somewhere else. Um, and only very few handset manufacturers are large enough to be a member of the club and to become a customer of them. It's not like any other electronic component where you, you just go to DigiKey and you order it, or you go to your favorite uh, semiconductor distributor and you buy a couple of thousand, a hundred or ten, or whatever is the amount you want. Right? It's not like this. The cell phone baseband industry, if you, if you ever find any public documentation about those chipsets at all, on the websites of the companies that manufacture them, it always says asterisk, and asterisk in the footnote says, this product is for large selected customers who produce large volumes of handsets only. So you have to be one of the select customers to even get access to the technology. Um, so there are, you know, a couple of dozen companies, if at all, that are large enough that drive the millions of units of quantity that they can actually become a customer of those companies. If you look at the network manufacturing side, it's very much the same situation. Um, this is not really the subject of this talk. I just want to outline this. The network equipment, the cell towers, the back-end equipment, the core GSM network, and so on. There's only Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens, Alcatel, Lucent, and Huawei, and a couple of other smaller ones. Um, and only operators buy equipment from them. Uh, and the prices are extremely high since the quantities are low and it's professional grade equipment and professional grade equipment always has to cost 10 times at least the amount. Um, 
So if we look at the GSM and generally the cellular operators, it's also a very unfortunate situation. Now, some operators may take this uh, as an insult. Uh, I apologize for that, but it really is that operators, at least many operators, are banks and marketing departments today. Operators outsource not only the network planning, the network deployment, and the network servicing, but they also outsource the network building. So what else is there to remain, right? It's, it's marketing, it's sales, um, and it's finance. Um, and the operators mostly only know the, the closed equipment as they're shipped by the manufacturer. They get, their staff gets some training in how to configure it, how to put it there, how to set it up, how to make it work. But they have very limited understanding of how it actually works. Um, and if you talk to some operators, then you will hear, yeah, you know, 10 years ago, we still got the full source code from Ericsson and we could see what's actually going on, but these days they don't give it to us anymore. Um, this is the kind of uh, stories you hear um, from those few people at operators who actually would go down to the lower protocol layers. Now, the security implications of all of this is that we have very few people who actually understand the protocol stack outside the manufacturers of the baseband processes and the network equipment. There's very li relatively limited protocol level research. Um, if you find research, it's related on the cryptographic side. Um, it's on application level, like mobile malware and so on. It's all important research, but it's on a different level than, than uh, the kind of stuff that I happen to be interested in. And before Osmocom BB and OpenBSC and OpenBTS and the projects that uh, have been started in the last uh, two years, um, we didn't have any open source protocol implementations, which I believe are key to make people able to learn more about this. Um, there's no point for any student to just read a textbook about GSM protocols. I mean, they're not even any good textbooks for, the, for that, you know, as a start. But even if you want to read those textbooks, you cannot make any practical exercises. You cannot go to a lab. You cannot test what, what you've been reading about, unlike the Internet. And this is really the reason why the Internet has received so much analysis, so much innovation, so much scrutiny, God knows what. And the GSM world is this, this you know, closed uh, user group. Um, now, if you want to look more at the protocols, how do you get started? You can start on the network side. This has been done by OpenBSC and OpenBTS in the last couple of years. I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, this has been done. And in January um, last year, uh, I decided to take off uh, three months in order to um, get started on actually doing the telephone side protocol stack. GSM is very asymmetric on the air interface and on any other interface. So if you run a network equipment, then you can exchange data with, uh, with phones. And if you run a telephone, then you can exchange data with the network. But you can never exchange data directly from phones or directly from one BTS to another BTS uh, in, in the actual fixed network. So it's very asymmetric. So if you want to send arbitrary packets to, to uh, networks, uh, to, to BTSs, base station controllers, all the actual network operator equipment, what you need is sort of the Wi-Fi card or the Ethernet card of GSM where, like on the internet, you have a very stupid transceiver that implements the physical layer, the MAC layer, and all the IP packets and, and every bit in the IP header and the TCP header and so on, you can define yourself, you can modify, you can, you can handcraft, you know, strange packets, you can see how systems react to that. In GSM, so far, this has not been possible, um, at least not using publicly av available equipment. And this is why we started Osmocom BB, um, there have been some other projects that try to do this um, have, that have failed. There was a TSM-30 project in the past, and there was MadOS. Um, they both got very far, but they never actually got to the point where their own code could run and could drive the full telephone hardware and could actually interact with the uh, telephone network. So bootstrapping processes, you read about GSM specifications, you start to grow knowledge about the protocols, um, and so on. You, you try to get protocol traces and, and uh, you, you start to work from there. Since we've been doing the network side GSM stack with OpenBSC uh, in the past, of course we already had a lot of experience, now we only needed to implement the other part. This is just a rough overview of how a GSM network works, just to um, get this back into your uh, memory. You may have seen this before. What we are talking about here is the air interface. That's the interface between the telephone and the BTS. 
And now we want to run a telephone where every aspect of the air interface, of the physical layer, of the medium access layer, of the higher layers, are entirely controlled um, and defined by open source software. So we can modify the timing of the signals, the power of the signals. We want to modify every bit of the signal, everything. And that's why we want to own the baseband here and run our custom code on this phone so we can generate signals towards the BTS, which then gets forwarded into the actual core network of GSM. Not going to go into the details here. Um, this is just, if you read the slides, so you get explanations for the acronyms, what those are. Now, what kind of protocols do we have? Yeah, we have to go through this quickly. You want to see an extensive demo, don't you? So, um, <laughs> we have a protocol stack um, that is defined by a couple of layers. First of all, there's the radio layer. It's specified in GSM technical specification, TS04.04. If you Google for GSM TS04.04, you will get the very uh, specification that we're talking about. So this is, again, the pointer is uh, if you want to read more. On top of the radio layer, we have the LabDM, which is a, a ISDN-derived um, uh, layer 2 protocol. And on layer 3, we have um, sub layers that are called radio resource mobility management and call control. And then there is sort of stuff that's not really defined as a layer, but there are more layers uh, without a defined number for USSD, SMS, location services, and so on. Um, in order to, uh, well, look at the various security problems that have been described in theory in order to practically implement them, we now need to implement the protocol stack and we need to implement drivers on the actual hardware um, uh, to, to run that code. The couple of interesting security problems that have been widely spoken about is, well, there's no mutual authentication. We know that by now. That leads to IMSI catchers. It leads to man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, rogue base station attacks, whatever you might call them. Weak encryption algorithms. We've been hearing all about this. We know encryption is optional. We know there is a denial of service against the random access channel, which has first been publicized by our co-developer Dieter Spahr in late 2009. Um, we also know there's the radio resource location protocol that uh, allows the network to obtain GPS fixes of the handset without any information to the user. There are all kinds of issues in, in GSM regarding security and privacy. Now, what we, need to want, what we need to do is we need to control the baseband processor in the telephone. If you don't know much about how um, modern telephones work, then um, let me just say the baseband processor is not what you run your, your uh, Android on or your Windows Mobile or your Symbian or well, Symbian maybe in some cases. But in, in smartphones, you typically have two processors. One of them is the application processor that runs the user interface and, and you know, all the high-level stuff. Then you have the baseband processor, which is completely independent or not so independent. Um, but in, it's a, a separate processor running a separate operating system, running a separate code base. Um, so uh, this is the, the processor we're talking about. So what is this processor? We typically see ARM7 or ARM9 cores in the low-end phones that we are looking at uh, and the GSM uh, as, as a first step. It's ARM7 cores. They run some real-time operating system. Sometimes, actually, they don't run any operating system because it's not required to have an operating system for the kind of tasks it does. Um, we very often, or well, at least on an ARM7 core, it's very clear that you have no memory protection between tasks because, well, an ARM7 doesn't have a memory management unit. There are no virtual addresses. There's nothing. Um, then next to the ARM core, you have a DSP. The actual DSP model and type depends on the vendor of the baseband chipset. The DSP runs the signal processing part for the RF layer one. It's only the signal processing part. Um, don't think that the DSP runs the entire layer one. That's a wrong assumption. So uh, the DSP really only does signal processing and it's triggered uh, by, by the ARM. So the ARM core is the master DSP, sort of an acceleration slave in, in, in the um, device. The software stack, well, is written in C and assembly, lacks modern security features, most of the time at least. Uh, and uh, well, Philip Weinmann has already um, spoken about this yesterday, what kind of things you can do with this. Now. The GSM baseband chipset that we're looking at uh, in the Osmo ComVV project uh, is uh, looking like this. Uh, this is just a very high-level overview. We have a digital baseband processor on the left-hand side. Contains the DSP, contains the ARM core, contains some static RAM, some mask ROM, uh, UART, SPI, the typical microcontroller peripherals, right? It's like an, you know, 
uh, any random ARM7 microcontroller with a couple of GSM specific peripherals inside. Um, next to that, we have the analog baseband, the ABB, which contains the analog digital converter, digital analog converter, to actually um, interface between a digital domain on the left hand side and the analog domain on the right hand side. Um, here we have the RF transceiver, mixer, VCO, PLL. That's the device that converts the analog baseband signal that we have here. It converts it up into the respective frequency bands for GSM 900 megahertz or DCS, uh, PCS 1800, 1900 megahertz, and so on. We have a power amplifier here that amplifies the signal when we transmit, and we have an antenna switch because there's only a single antenna, and it, in, in this case, it's a... Uh, this is a uh, three uh, tri to quad band design here. You see the antenna switch has to switch between two different transmit paths depending on the frequency and three different receive paths again depending on the frequency. Um, we have a couple of more signals between them but that's, uh, if you want to read more about that I've written a paper on uh, um, the telephone anatomy and uh, you, can, you can read more about the details how this works together, um, this entire beast. So, what do we want to, what do we need in order to achieve what we want, the Ethernet card for GSM? We need the baseband chipset under our control, we need the layer one, we need the layer two, we need the layer three. All of them need to be open source so we can modify them and so on. None of the components existed so we had to start. Um, there's a couple of different approaches you can do this. One of them is, well, you use documented standard off-the-shelf components and do everything from scratch. So you use a CPU that's publicly available, that's publicly documented. You use a DSP that's publicly documented. You write all the code. You use an FPGA for the, for the synchronous time-controlled uh, 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 signals in GSM. Um, which means you don't need reverse engineering. You, uh, however, need a lot of work in the hardware and, and digital logic design and analog, logic de uh, analog design. Um, and in the end, you will end up with something which will be very expensive because it's low quantity. It's a very special purpose device. It's not a neat telephone or something like that. However, as I said, you don't need any secret information. You don't need any reverse engineering. Now, the other option is you can build a board yourself by using existing baseband chipsets. Now, I just previously mentioned that you cannot just go somewhere and buy them. Well, luckily, there, are, there is the gray market for semiconductors, where fab factories in China that, ha that didn't actually, I mean, they order 100,000 components, and then they only use 90,000. So what do we do? they do with the remaining 10,000? They put it up for auctions in the gray, ma gray market. So you can, you can buy uh, uh, lots of components that are not generally available from these uh, gray market uh, uh, traders. Um, that uh, trade in, in uh, surplus semiconductors. Um, it's an entire industry in itself. Now, um, and it's quite amazing. I mean, I did this for the Calypso in the beginning when we started, and um, I put in an interest. You can say, well, I'm interested in this or that component, and I never had that many emails in my inbox ever before on a single day. So <laughs> hundreds of Chinese companies trying to sell me this chip. Um, for something like, I don't know, two dollars each or something, right? It's not that they would earn a lot of money with this, but it uh, works. I, I wanted ten, by the way, yeah? Ten. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. yeah, so you can build some hardware, but yeah, it's still custom hardware. You still need, well, you need reverse engineering because, well, you get the chip, but you don't know how it works. Um, and yeah, custom hardware is still low quantity. So the lazy approach that we took, luckily, um, we found an existing mobile phone that we could repurpose where, well, we know the hardware is working, we know all the analog and digital design is working, otherwise the regular phone wouldn't work. Um, we don't need hardware prototyping, we don't need to do revisions, um, we don't need to do that much, um, well, if you can get the schematics with so many phones you can find as part of service manuals and so on, the amount of reverse engineering on the, on the circuit board level is relatively limited. However, still the reverse engineering related to the actual component, the baseband processor and, and the other peripherals is still there. Um, but in the end you can focus more of your time to the actual protocol software um, as opposed to, you know, doing hardware design and, you know, sourcing components and going to a prototype shop and spending a lot of money on yeah, and again, you're making a small mistake somewhere. So, yeah, by searching for suitable phones, there's a couple of criteria, right? We want a phone that's as cheap as possible because, well, we might break a couple of them in the process. Uh, it should be readily available, which means many people can play with it. If you do something like this with a phone where you have the single remaining unit in the market left, then, well, yeah, you can do it and you can be happy that you did it, but where's the point if nobody else can use the result of your work? So, you want to use a phone that 
everyone who's interested in the subject can still buy and can play with the open source software that you create. Um, and of course, you want to use a baseband chipset where a lot of information is known that shouldn't be known. And the result of this was we went for the Texas Instruments Calypso chipset, where the digital baseband documentation uh, interestingly appeared on Cryptome quite a number of years ago already. Uh, the analog baseband documentation you can find on Chinese telephone developer websites, which are a very, very useful resource, by the way. Stuff like 50, 52RD BBS and, and other sites are uh, a, a real fountain of, of uh, wealth of, of information. Um, the source code of a GSM stack that ran on a very strange telephone design based on that chipset was on SourceForge for four years. And nobody ever really, you know, TI never took it down. Uh, of course, it was not legitimately on SourceForge, right? Um, so after I made my first presentation, it was taken away from SourceForge, but uh, of course there are many copies around, you know, the internet doesn't forget. Um, also, well, um, the telephones uh, are end of life, the chipset is end of life, but uh, you can still, until 2008, you can still, you could, you could have still bought phones with that chipset. That means only two years ago, there are lots of phones that are still somewhere in a stock or secondhand market is still very large. The other chipset we've started to look at is MediaTek chipsets, where MediaTek is a Taiwanese company that uh, is shipping 95 million uh, baseband chipsets a quarter right now. Um, it's a very high volume. They basically own the, the low-end uh, GSM phone market today. Um, and uh, yeah, you can find SDKs, you can find documentation and so on, and that's uh, going to be the not next target. But for the first target, we chose the TI Calypso because more information was available at that time. We started in January, which is, by the way, 12 months ago, not nine. I should just remove that. Um, and uh, yeah, we implement the, the baseband software from scratch. That means protocol stack, hardware drivers. We also want to do some user interface. We don't really have it on the phone yet. Uh, however, we have a verbose user interface on the PC that many people will like because it's modeled after a Cisco-style uh, telnet interface. We have, you know, <laughs> tab completion and everything. Um, so the name, by the way, is Open Source Mobile Communications Baseband. Um, right, so the, no questions about that. Um, the software architecture, well, we reuse code from OpenBSC whenever possible. I mean, after all, we already have an open source implementation for the network side of the protocol stack. Um, so we split the generic part into a library called libosmo core, the open source mobile core library, um, which we use both for the telephone side and for the network side of uh, the GSM uh, stack. And we run as little as possible, a little software as possible in the phone um, uh, because, well, debugging code on the PC is much easier, right? If you want to do debugging of some embedded stuff running in an ARM microcontroller, JTAG and all that stuff, and you always need to download your new code, and it's, it's just not as convenient as debugging it on the PC where you can just run it on Valgrind or you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, you have more screen real estate, right? That's an important factor in debugging something. So what we do now is that we do, of course, the hardware drivers have to run in the phone. Um, we also run the layer one, which is the time synchronous, very timing critical real time part of the GSM stack that runs also in the phone. But layers two and layer three and everything above that runs, so far runs on the PC, which makes, as I said, things much easier for you. Of course, it's written in a way that we can easily move the layer two and layer three into the phone at some later point uh, when we want to create something that uh, doesn't require a PC attached to the phone all the time. We have a couple of interfaces. Uh, there's an interface between the layer one on the phone and the layer two on the PC. It's called layer one control. It's completely custom. There's no specification how to do something like that in the GSM specification. It's a message-based protocol using a HDLC-like la layer on over RS-232 that goes to the telephone. Um, and we have the layer two code that exposes an interface called RSLMS. If anyone has ever heard of RSL, it's the radio signaling link that's used in the core, well, no, in the radio access network, but the network side of GSM. We modified it to be able to use it on the telephone side as well. It doesn't really fit 100%, but 90% uh, at least. The firmware, so we, we cross-compile a firmware that contains the layer one, it contains um, NOR drivers, LCD drivers, drivers for the hardware, all that. We compile it, we cross-compile it, and we install it onto the actual device. And we will show how that works in, in just uh, a very short time. Um, there are some, uh, well, uh, layer 23 is how we call the, the sum of all the host software programs. 
Uh, that con that contains, well, layer 23 is layer 2 and layer 3, and layer 23 is a good number, so that's why it's called layer 23. Um, and uh, it, it uses this layer 1 control API to control the layer 1 on the phone, and it implements, as I said, layer 2, layer 3, cell reselection, SIM card. We can access real SIM cards. We can also emulate SIM cards. Um, and we have a support for various apps, and we'll, we'll talk about those apps um, in a minute. Now, the hardware, let me just briefly talk about the hardware before we can go into the demo and, and uh, the actual applications. The hardware that we support, once again, it's the TI Calypso Yota Rita chipset. Um, if, well, most people don't know, you know, how can I buy a phone with that chipset? The phones that you can buy are called Motorola C100. 110 something, like, you know, 115, 16, 17, 18, uh, 120, 21, 22, 23, and so on and so on. I don't know why they have so many different models. They just differ in, in you know, the mechanical design or some, some minor feature here or there, but fundamentally it's all the same. Um, most of our development and testing is uh, done on the C123 and C155 phones. And by the way, also the GSM modem in the OpenMoco uh, telephones uh, has the same chipset and somebody has uh, ported it to make work, to, to, well, port. You don't need, really need to port much, but somebody has made it run also on those phones. If you look at a, a PCB of such a phone uh, and you remove the shielding covers, it looks a bit like this. You have the actual Calypso, the digital baseband chip down here. It's typically the largest chip in the device. Next to it, we have RAM and flash. Um, this is static RAM, it's SRAM, and it's NOR flash. So there's no NAND flash, no DRAM, you know, no refresh, cyc uh, refresh cycles or anything like that. Um, it's all very, how can I say, low-end deterministic. The CPU doesn't have any caches. The RAM is driven without any wait cycles. You, you deterministically can tell how long ins instruction will take, so you can make sure everything will fit within the tight timing margins of, of the TDMA system that GSM is. This is the analog baseband chip over here. Um, we have a SIM card socket. Well, uh, this is the transceiver chip um, that up-converts from the baseband into the RF band and down-converts. Um, this is the antenna, or the RF power amplifier, and left of it the antenna switch module, and this is where the antenna connects to. Um, also see a battery connector, you see a vibrator connector, you see a headset connector, a buzzer, and so on. This phone does not have a USB interface or anything like that. It's a very, very simple phone. So how do we install code on a telephone? You, you plug a 2.5 millimeter audio jack into the audio socket, and you download it over RS-232 into the audio socket. That's, that's, the official, that's the official way how all these telephones have been built at that time. It's the official way how they do factory uh, flashing of the software and, and calibration and so on. It all goes through the earphone jack because, well, you can't do it over the power jack, can you? The other thing that you have is the earphone jack. So there's actually a, a GPIO line that you can talk in, and this line determines whether it's analog headset or whether it's digital RS-232 uh, serial line. Now, what do we have working? We have the hardware drivers, we have the layer one, does doing power management, doing carrier synchronization, bit synchronization, TDMA frame synchronization, receive and transmit of bursts, various different bursts. We do automatic gain control, frequency hopping, encryption is not on the slide yet. We have the layer two, we have the layer three, and we have cell reselection. Um, so basically, we have a full phone. There are some things that are missing. Um, uh, it can also, of course, do phone calls, right, and SMS. Um, it has full rate and EFR codec, um, different assignment schemes. We do a SIM card interface, authentication with that. Some things it cannot do. Uh, we don't do in neighbor cell measurements yet, uh, which also means we don't do handover yet. So you cannot really move around using an, while you have an active call with Osmocom BB. Yet. That's sort of the, the only practical constraint, that, uh, the most important practical constraint. We don't have a user interface on the phone, but well, if somebody wants to do it. Um, uh, there are no circuit switch data calls, there's no GPRS, and of course there's no type approval, but that's not really something we're aiming for anyway. So, um, you can establish control channels and signaling channels and so on uh, to both hopping and non-hopping and encrypted and non-encrypted cells, and you can send them random messages and, and do whatever you want. We have control over the synthesizer, and we can, this is a regular GSM telephone meant for commercial GSM networks, but because we have control over the synthesizer, we can adjust the frequency and go into the railway GSM network. Um, there's no restriction in the hardware that prevents you from doing so, so you just 
tune it a couple of, you know, it's actually two or four megahertz lower than the regular GSM band, and there you go, and you receive uh, DB Systel, uh, Deutsche Bahn, uh, here in, in Berlin. Um, and, uh, well, we can send arbitrary messages. We have traffic channel voice calls and so on. Um, Steve will be doing a couple of demos about the various different applications. Um, so maybe we can switch the projector, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the input of the projector to Steve's laptop over there, and he will give you a demonstration of the mobile application. Uh, this was an instruction to whoever controls the Beamer to please switch over. <laughs> Not sure if there's some magic keyword I need to trigger. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So apparently yeah. some, yeah, okay. Steve can go ahead and, and present on what he can do with the mobile program. Yeah. So I'm, I'll demo the mobile implementation first. Um, First of all, um, we have an application called Osmo Khan, which connects to the um, phone via the serial port, um, which is already started. Um, yeah, sure. So this is, by the way, the setup. So we have this, um, this 2.5 millimeter audio <laughs> going into the earphone, right? Um, and, and this is a regular phone. There's no modification has been made to either software or hardware of this phone. Yeah. So. Um, now OsmoCon is connected to the serial port and waits for the um, bootloader command from the phone. Um, and it opens a socket to which um, higher layer, layer programs like mobile or, um, or other applications we'll show in a minute um, can connect. So now I'll start the mobile application which connects to the socket. Um, I already can open the VTI. Um, here you and can uh, see, it still tells you it's the OpenBSC control interface. It's a copy and paste mistake. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, now I'll boot up the phone. You can see that the code is downloaded. And there it goes. Now it connects to the network. It just read the SIM card data and does a power measurement over the whole spectrum. Yeah, you get the same colorful output as OpenBSC gives you. <laughs> but now somehow it loops. Uh, let me check. So what it does, it cycles over all the different radio frequencies, obtains power measurements um, and to determine where actually a cell is located and where um, uh, it uh, receives a signal and so on. Um, and. Um, uh, hopefully it will find our network that we are running here. Oh, um, yeah, that looks good. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah, this, those are very verbose debugging outputs, so these bit errors are nothing uncommon. <clears throat> yeah, so now we are connected. And, yeah, of course, what would you do? Let's try a phone call. <clears throat> uh, you can call me. Uh, you're still on the, on the shell. You have to restart the telnet. Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, you can call the 9401 if you want. What was it, 941? 9401. Say something. Say something into the phone. What did you just say? Test. 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 There's a help mode integrated in the 
in DVTI, so <laughs> you have a configuration file where you can um, handcraft your uh, and put your own in, um, uh, email or all the config settings in there. So let me just show it. Um, so here you specify the e email. You can emulate all kinds of features. You can say you have no encryption support or um, no full rate speech support. So you can basically configure your whole phone or um, um, let the network believe that you have a 10-year-old mobile phone, for example. So there's yeah. a lot of testing that can be done. Yeah, you can also do things, um, uh, since we have full control, you can also do things like um, sort of alter your, uh, your position as it appears to the mobile network because there's this timing advance that is uh, used between the telephone and the BTS, uh, which sort of gives the network an indication how far you are from the BTS. And since we control the timing, of course, we can just adjust our timing a little bit this way or a little bit the other way, and then we appear closer or further apart from the cell, which, uh, well, is an interesting feature, I guess. <laughs> We can, of course, also combine that by sending handcrafted or modified measurement results so the network will have an even, you know, even uh, more complete uh, idea that we are really somewhere else than we claim we are. So, yeah, one more thing to show maybe is um, we have fully integrated Wireshark support so you can um, use... <laughs> Um, I can call you, actually. Uh, yeah, just wait a second. I s uh, actually started it without the Wireshark support. Um, ah. So there you have it. You see all the um, okay, you already information in, right? messages that go um, from the BTS to the phone and the other way around. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to call this phone. Uh, let's see if it's already completely connected. I'm not sure. Uh, it doesn't seem now it's to. completely collect, uh, connected. I was dialing too soon. Sorry for that. Yeah, that looks, like, that looks good. Yeah, call is connected. We have um, auto call. Yeah, uh, now if you can look in the Wireshark, you will see the setup request coming yeah, from sure. my telephone number. Um, if you go. Yeah, Back let's see where the actually call was established. Does connect a little bit further up here? Yeah, there's the connect. There was the call alerting, yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah, the ring, when, when the phone is ringing, you get the alerting message and so on. So, uh, this is the... Yeah, but you can um, completely use it for, for analysis of the yeah. GSM traffic. Okay, yeah. let's move to the next app. Can we please switch over to this laptop again for a very short time? Um, or if it doesn't work, I have this. Yeah, you have the slides, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> It, it seems that Osmocom is not the only uh, sort of, I don't know, the only thing where handover is not working yet. <laughs> Was it Celloc? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry? Is it, is it mine? Ah, okay. <laughs> mine okay, well, okay, I own it. Um, so, uh, the other application that we have is a cell log application. I'm just going through two slides now. Um, the cell log application allows you to scan uh, and, and log cell beacon information. Um, you can uh, also then send random access channel requests uh, to get the timing advance. So this, so sort of we request a channel from, e we request a channel from each cell we see, um, and uh, by establishing a channel for a short time, uh, this timing advance is negotiated, and thereby we also know how far the cell is, ap is, is apart from, from us, a certain granularity. And then if you connect a GPS receiver, you can uh, obtain um, well, the, you, can, you can get all this information, and there's a second program called GSM Map that then parses those logs and uses triangulation to calculate the estimated cell position and generates KML files that you can use with Google Earth. And now...
Um, can we please switch over to Steve's laptop again? Thank you. <laughs> ah. Uh, yeah. So. Once again, same procedure. Start up the phone. Yeah, now it does the initial power um, measurement just like mobile did. And now it tries to synchronize to all RCNs found. Um, and there you see that's the first cell, a T Mobile cell, and it has a timing at once of zero, which is um, zero to 500 meters away. Yeah. Which is not too surprising given that we are at a very yeah. central location in Berlin. Sure, and there's our cell, Open BC. <laughs> 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 and of course it has a timing at once of zero <laughs> yeah so that runs in the loop you see um, there are over 500 measurements left but um, it creates a log file let me just show uh, was it there no wow and it saves um, the system information message messages and the uh, reception level of all cells and of course the timing at once and um, then you can feed that into um, the GSM map application and um, you get something like this. So this is the way that was traveled with the phone yeah? and um, it calculates with the measurements made um, the distance and position of the cell, of the cell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do it in a larger scale as well, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or even get cells from other countries. Yeah, th this is at the, at the northern coast of Germany, doing some measurements, and uh, you can actually get cells from Denmark, and you ski get the triangulations into Denmark up there. About accu accuracy, um, let me check. Um, yeah, it isn't actually that accurate because you have um, those um, steps are like in 500 meters, and um, it. It's marked there, but it's actually there. So, but it isn't uh, it isn't uh, that high resist um, difference. Yeah. So, oh no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was not what was not supposed to have. <laughs> Okay, yeah. you can continue with the slides, Steve. I think it's easier that way. Okay. I mean, just show the slides. I can, I can do the introductory sure. thing. And, um, that was the GSM map application. Yeah, so. yeah the, the other one is actually the first thing I think, I, if I remember correctly, was the first thing we had is the BCCH scan application, which is uh, relatively similar. It iterates over the full spectrum. It does a power scan. Then it tunes to all the channels that it has a very high received signal strength acquires the, the broadcast common uh, control channel and dump system information and so on to, excuse me, to Wireshark. So it's sort of a, a predecessor of, of what uh, BCCH log and, and uh, cell log and, and so on can do now. I think it's no point in demonstrating it separately, is it? I mean, you've seen that we can send the messages into Wireshark. It's, well. Basically the same thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, then we have CBCH Sniff, which is a, a, a cell broadcast channel sniffer um, uh, that just gets all the data it can get from the cell broadcast channel. Cell broadcast channel is something that used to be used more than it is today. Um, uh, when some operators are actually doing um, uh, putting their GPS coordinates of the cells in the cell broadcast. Um, I think O2 is the example in Germany here. Um, there are some more apps in there that are mostly R&D related. 
Um, and uh, well, the idea is that we have this stack now and we have libraries and interfaces in there that you can use it. So if you want to write a, a scapey fuzzing gateway application that just establishes a radio channel to a cell and then you can send arbitrary packets from scapey maybe over UDP into this gateway and then over there, it's all there. The point is that we have those libraries, go ahead, write your own applications, do interesting things. Okay, so sort of a summary of uh, what uh, has been going on. Um, the GSM industry has been making it very hard to do security analysis, um, legitimate and non-legitimate. Um, there are uh, well-known security problems in the GSM stacks, both in the implementation as well as in the specification itself. Um, now we have multiple solutions for sending arbitrary protocol data, both from the network as well as from the telephone. Um, we can, there's open BSA, BSC, open BTS for the network side, there's Osmo Combi B from uh, the, the, um, the baseband uh, side of the telephone. We also have injection proxies, so if you get at one of the other interfaces in the network, in the core network, then you can also inject messages from there. So that's, that's really all there now. Um, where to go from here? Yeah, as I said, um, we're still waiting for somebody to do the fuzzing integration. Um, it's up to the security to make a uh, security community to make use of this and I personally think TCP IP security has been boring for a number of years there's RFID there's Tetra there's GSM there's 3G there's DECT you know there are all these communication systems out there you know why why did nobody ever present here about a, a GPS transmitter that sends arbitrary satellite information and confuses GPS receivers and so on there's so many communication systems out there that are waiting for somebody to do secure, practical security analysis. You know, don't look at TCP IP all the time. It's boring, it's old. <laughs> okay, um, some thanks because this really is a group project. Um, we have Dieter Spa who has been very invaluable to the project. Unfortunately, he was not able to make it to the presentation due to a lot of snow and he lives in a very remote location. We have Andreas Eversberg who has been doing well, spending most of his summer to implement the layer three and the cell reselection and all this. Uh, Sylvain Mounon who has already been on stage yesterday doing a lot of layer one and DSP work. Um, and we have other developers who are working on open source GSM stuff, um, just uh, to name a few. Um, I really want to thank these guys. They boldly go where no man has gone before. Some, some links if you want to read more about all this. And now we have 14 minutes for questions. Uh, please raise your hand and uh, you know, go to a microphone and so on. Don't, don't just scream or shout into the hall. Questions? And as for the questions I want uh, to uh, say is that please go to the uh, microphone stands on the left and the right side. Hey, go to the microphone stands, not outside the door. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a question over there. Uh, you mentioned that OpenMocos has the same chip, so since it already has a USB port, how feasible it is to run those tests on it? Have you tried it? Uh, the USB port of any smartphone, including the OpenMoco smartphones, is connected to the application processor, which is a different processor on the same device. Um, so if you want to run Osmo VB on the OpenMoco telephone, what you do is you run the layer 2, layer 23, all the applications. You run it on the application processor of the telephone itself and you run the layer one and the firmware that we do for the baseband processor in the processor. So with the OpenMoco phone, you don't need a PC and the phone, but you can run everything inside the phone. But without an external PC, how do you type in the commands to the Telnet command line? So you will still somehow need to access it externally. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, hello. Ah. I have some questions from other missions. Uh, one question from Wutang in, uh, in uh, England is, would it be possible to create a peer-to-peer -peer GSM network with this modified base, base band? 
Not really. Um, the, the fundamental problem that you face is that the uh, uplink and downlink frequencies, which is the frequency from the cell to the phone and from the phone to the cell, they are, depending on the band, between 45 and 90 megahertz apart in frequency. Um, and uh, there are hardware filters in, in the receive and transmit path of the telephone uh, that limit uh, the, uh, uh, the frequencies you can receive or transmit on. If you do those hardware modifications, I mean, so if you do hardware modifications to exchange or replace those filters, then you can turn one telephone permanently into the other way. So it, it could behave like a cell, but then it could no longer behave like a phone. And aside all of that, you have problems with the timing because the, the timing is al there's always a clock master. It's a, it's a synchronous system. All the telephones are slaves of the clock master, the BTS. So, um, you can probably get a prototype working of two telephones or three telephones talking to each other, but it's never going to scale and it's never going to work, and especially not without hardware modifications. So I think it's a bad technology for, for doing that. Hi. Hypothetically, uh, sorry, does the baseband software have to identify itself to the operator? So hypothetically, if you were to talk to a real network, would you have to lie and pretend you were one of the four official baseband software or some derivative? No, there's, there's no inquiry, neither authenticated or non-authenticated, onto what particular implementation it is running. There's nothing like that. You, you indicate the features that you support, like do you support this codec or this cipher, or do you do this, or which band do you support, what's your transmit power, and so on, but it's always on feature base and never on vendor base. Are operators likely to get annoyed if you were to, or are there any legal implications if you would hypothetically run this against a real network? Well, if you hypothetically run it, I think there's no legal implications. But if you re <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, but if you practically run it on a real work network, which works very well, by the way. <clears throat> uh, um, I don't really think there are legal... Um, okay, so you might violate the terms of services of the operator. And um, if, you don't, if the transmitter, in case the transmitter would not behave according to the uh, regulatory uh, uh, things, um, uh, regulatory uh, requirements, then you may have some issues there. Um, but uh, even then, unless you, you actually disrupt communications in a, in a public telephone network, that's sort of, at least according to German law, if you disrupt or, or interfere with a public communications network that's uh, subject to five, up to five years of imprisonment. So that's really serious. But just, you know, if it transmits a little bit strangely without causing interference, that's uh, a minor offense, uh, not, not a big deal. Yes, um, you might violate the terms of services and the operator may, may terminate the contract or something, but uh, it's not really a, a, a serious uh, issue, um, at least based on my knowledge about the legal situation here in Germany. Um, you said about the timing advance, that you can change the timing advance as you like to, ch to fake your position. Uh, but I remember a lecture from my professors in, elect in electric, elect um, electric engineering that it's a problem because if you move it too, too long, then you, then you will destroy the timing because you are, have a distance to the base station and so the timing advance is to compensate for this distance. And if you, if you uh, move it too long, then you will destroy all the other packets of the other people who have a different distance to the pa uh, station. No, 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 no. The point is not that you transmit... R so what, what we do with the timing advance is that the network tells us, uh, based on your current receive delay, please switch to timing advance 2 but we don't switch to two, maybe we switch to three, but we tell the network we switch to two. So on the air interface, everything is like it's supposed to be, everything is in the time slot it's supposed to be, just because the network told us something different than we did, there is an, an, a wrong assumption of where we are, but there's nothing, no interference or anything wrong on the air interface. What would happen if, for example, put, you're standing next to the base station and put the maximum value of timing advance? Well, the point is that we never put the maximum value. We just claim to the network that we are. Okay, you claim it, okay. But, but you yeah. don't do it because otherwise it would, would destroy the packets. Yeah. Um, okay, so what about doing man-in-the-middle man attacks? Because you could, for example, take the phone into a base station and take the next phone to be a phone, and then you can, for example, do man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, that's... 
only possible um, if you know the, uh, well, the, the problem is there's still the authentication and encryption at that point. And even if you break, um, well, sort of, you need to break the, the encryption key fast enough um, in, in such a setup. I'm not sure how, how feasible it is right now, um, but uh, it's definitely not as easy as, as some people may think to do the full man in the middle that actually behaves like a proxy. By the way, Rode & Schwarz, a German company of, uh, uh, well, of an infamous name, um, is, uh, has a, a patent on this. It's called the virtual BTS, the VBTS, and there's a European patent on, on the man in the middle attacking GSM networks. <laughs> Another question here from uh, somewhere else uh, in the planet. Can, you, can one create a GSM server? Um, there is no terminology in GSM like this. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, I mean, a GSM base station, um, some people are, well, a telephone doesn't have the processing capacity that, that would allow it to run a full base station. There some, Sylvain is doing some work on um, sort of doing a poor man solution that would allow you to make two phones talk to each other, but it's, uh, the processing power of the DSP is not meant to, to, uh, to fulfill the requirements of a base station because a telephone only always transmits and receives on one time slot because it, you know, it has one conversation. You don't have two or three or four parallel conversations on a single GSM phone, so you use one time slot. But the base station always needs to provide eight time slots at least um, uh, for all the other telephones and so on. And the uh, CPU, the DSP is just not capable of processing eight different uh, time slots all the time. So uh, there's some, some restrictions. Okay. Uh, when I use the Osmocon BB on a, a commercial provider network, uh, should I be afraid of disturbing the provider's network in somehow, or is it that stable already so that I'm not afraid to, to crash the operator's network? I will not recommend you to do that, no. Um, I mean, it is an experimental project. It's meant uh, for experimentation. Um, uh, we are using this uh, mostly against our own networks. Um, we are also using it, I mean, it also depends on what you do. If you just want to do logging, if you just passively read the system information from the cells, then there's no way you can kind of cause interference. By the way, the default compile configuration of our software disables transmit. So unless you manually edit the make file and put in some, some statement that will uh, enable the code for transmit side, it will be received only, and in that case, you cannot cause any interference. So this is a way how you can, can start to play with. Um, the other thing is what, there are operators that are actually interested in testing their networks, and uh, there are some where we've been into the operator lab and, and be able to use our, our software against their, their lab uh, setup. Um, I mean, Yes, you can use it in a commercial network, but there's no type of approval, there's no, you know, no legal guarantee, and there's no technical guarantee. It's, it's um, you know, it, I'm, I'm fairly confident in the software, but, uh, you know, things can always go wrong. Uh, another question here. How big is the effort support to other basebands, like GNU Radio or USRP? That's a completely different architecture uh, than our architecture. The GNU radio and USRP are software-defined radios where all the signal processing happens in software, um, whereas the typical GSM design is a much more traditional uh, receiver design. And um, we are also using for the actual modulation and de no, for the, well, the modulation is done in hardware. In our case, there's hardware inside the analog baseband that does this. And the, uh, the demodulation of the signal is done inside the DSP, which has mask ROM code. Um, so the, the entire receiver architecture is very different. And uh, if you were to, so somebody actually did this. It's not open source, but somebody has taken the open BTS code um, and changed it to no longer be the, the uh, clock master, the BTS, but to implement the telephone side interface and then put the protocol stack on top of this. Um, you can do it, but you have to do, you have to know what you're doing. I mean, you need the actual receiver, in the, the signal processing part, um, in addition to our stack in order to run it on a software-defined radio. 
And that's for the signal processing of the telephone side, there's no open source uh, code for that. Also, the USRP costs thousands, well, it's a four digit amount of money. You know, the telephones we use, they cost, what, 15 euro, 20 euro? So um, I would strongly recommend using the telephone. And it has much more output power, right? It can transmit at two watts. The USRP only has a couple of hundred milliwatts. Uh, you mentioned you are also able to emulate the SIM card. So if you were to able by accident the SIM card of another subscriber from a mobile and make a call, um, would the other um, provider, the other person's SIM card get built? Uh, the problem with this is that you don't have the encryption key and uh, the authentication key uh, of, of the uh, other SIM card normally. Okay. Right. Um, so. <laughs> We can emulate it if you have the key, but you know, since normally you don't have the key, uh, you will not get uh, to this point, unfortunately. There is one exception, though. If you, okay, the session key, as Karsten Noel has pointed out yesterday, we only have one minute left. I have to do this quickly. If the session, the session key lasts typically a couple of sessions, it's not recycled every call or every SMS, depending on the operator. Um, so if you see one transaction and you crack the ciphering key of that transaction. So somebody's making a call, you, you record that, you crack the key using Kraken and Airprobe and so on, and then you uh, have the Timsy and the key and all the material you need, and then you contact the network again, and in, if the network is not configured to do authentication in this case, which a number of commercial networks are, then uh, yes, actually at that point you can make a call, one or maybe two calls depending on the network configuration uh, from that other subscriber's uh, um, uh, phone number and it will be billed to him. But I think it's very, you know, a uh, special case and depends a lot on the network configuration. I think, you know, most operators, if they don't have it yet already now today, it's very easy for them to switch to a configuration that, that prevents that. Okay. We have zero seconds left. Well, thank you for your attention and, uh, yeah. Have fun. Thank you.